This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom. I'm Margaret Harrington of Nuclear Free Future Conversation, and viewers, I'm pleased to welcome our guests with you. On my right is Maggie Gunderson, president of Fairwinds Energy Education, and to her right is Samantha Donald, producer, uh, administrator for Fairwinds Energy Education. And here is Arnie Gunderson, chief engineer, coming back from Fairwinds Energy Education, returning to Nuclear Free Future. And our first time guest here, also from Fairwinds Energy Education, is Nathaniel White Gile, who is the media producer for Fairwinds Energy Education. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you can be here to discuss our topic, which is decommissioning energy, Vermont nuclear, Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. And let's start from, from the top. Uh, who wants to jump in on, on the, uh, the momentous decision that Entergy uh, made on August 26th? August 26th, Entergy announced that at the end of this fuel cycle, they're going to, in 2014, they're going to shut down the plant permanently. And w so when is the end of the fuel cycle? Uh, what's October or November of, um, of 2014. So it's still a year away, year plus a little bit away. Um, they had to announce because they have to buy fuel. And if they weren't buying fuel, their employees would know immediately that there's a, that you know, something is wrong. And so when they made the decision not to buy fuel, they had to notify the employees, at which point they had to notify the public. And we, we the public, heard that on August 26th, and the reasons given were not about the safety of the plant or about the many things that we've been talking about on this conversation for the past several years. But what was the main reason? Well, Entergy's position is that the, the market didn't justify keeping the plant running. You know, what they tried to sell power to Vermont back in 2012 at uh, six and a half cents a, a, a kilowatt. Um, the market was only at four cents. So the Vermont utilities dug in and said, we're not buying from you. So um, had the Vermont utilities bought from Vermont Yankee, they might have continued to run because effectively Vermonters were subsidizing Vermont Yankee. But anyway, we got cheaper power by almost two cents. And um, uh, then the, the uh, combination of Fukushima Daiichi costs to, to fix it up. And um, uh, it's a standalone old plant. Um, and they had to fix their condenser. They were looking at something on the order of a quarter of a billion in plant improvements so that they, um, they decided to pull the plug instead. And what were they waiting for, Arnie? Yeah, in my opinion, um, just a couple weeks before that, the federal courts ruled in their favor uh, and basically said that um, the federal law preempts the, the Vermont law as far as nuclear safety issues go. I think they wanted that decision. If they had canceled the plant, uh, likely the decision never would have uh, been made. I think their minds were made up before that federal decision was ever made. And I think that uh, they wanted it in hand so that uh, uh, when Vermont starts to argue about the decommissioning of the plant, they'll be able to say, hey, look, the federal government disagrees with you. That's an interesting uh, uh, element in this discussion because most vi most viewers, including myself, wouldn't know about this, uh, or wouldn't put it together. Such as that, it's it's a it's a strategy for the public, is it not, to uh, to appeal to uh, to the, uh, the the credibility of Vermont Yankee. So, yeah, I think um, you know, they're going to claim that was strictly market forces, and the Vermonters had nothing to do with it, and, and um, that's part of the strategy, too, is to belittle the efforts of Vermonters and the legislature and the activists. Uh, and then separately, though, they wanted that piece of ammo in their back pocket about the, uh, the federal law. They, 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 that was an important piece in their chess strategy about what, you know, how to rein in Vermont and how to prevent us from you know, down the road, making other demands on them. And I, I think it's one more layer on that. I think that there was an industry strategy. Um, the nuclear industry heavily supported um, 
Vermont Yankee in its uh, fight against Vermont. And um, there were all kinds of lobbying efforts and, and, and the same attorneys that the whole industry uses. So I think that they wanted to put that out there so the industry could push back in any other state that tries to intervene because there's so many aging nuclear plants out there and that many of them are leaking, many of them don't have, have adequate emergency evacuation plans, on and on and on. And so I think they wanted to make sure that it becomes an issue only between them and the NRC because they have co-opted the NRC. The NRC does not regulate. You know, it's beholden to the industry. Exactly. And let's emphasize for, for our viewers again the uniqueness of Vermont's position that the legislature voted to, to shut down Vermont Yankee. And this is, is, it, is this unique in the United States for Vermont to have done that? Yeah, you know, we have to remember it, it wasn't um, a narrow victory. It was 26 to 4, including the leading Republican, Randy Brock, said that if um, anti-nuclear activists had infiltrated Vermont Yankees management, they couldn't have screwed it up any worse than Entergy did all by themselves. So it wasn't um, uh, political lines or anything like that. You know, Vermont Yankee um, uh, made you know terrible decisions and, and, and lied under oath, and in the process then alienated Vermonters for a long time. I mean, we don't forget in Vermont. You know, they, we trust until there's a reason not to trust, and and they cross the line, and it's hard to get back again. And it's true that Vermont is the only state that whose legislature has that power. Right. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. And Samantha, what do you think of the belittling of the uh, the, the anti-Vermont Yankee activists in all of this? I think it's it's just very reactionary, and you you want to blame someone, so you might as well target a group of people who <laughs> you know are are saying the opposite of what you want them to be saying. And, yes, and it, but it is a targeting, I believe. I agree with, with you know? Samantha. It's, it's definitely a targeting of um, the everyday people who have legitimate concerns. When you look at the Vermont Yankee site, and, and Samantha and I have, have talked about this and looked at that, you ha if there's an accident down there, the school bus drivers have to drive towards the plant to get families out, and many of those, this is just an example, many of those are mothers or fathers who have children in other school districts. So are you going to leave your kids somewhere else that's still in an evacuation zone and, and drive in there? The roads can't handle that kind of traffic. It would, so they've got to drive in against people leaving the area and evacuating. There is not, as, as Samantha and I talked about, there is not adequate evacuation procedures. And it for covers the, three states right. as well. Massachusetts and New Hampshire are within the very small range of um, huge contamination if there were to be an accident. And downriver, really all of Massachusetts right. is downriver. Um, is it true that uh, that Vermont Yankee is continuing those evacuation drills, or, 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 or are they in charge of those drills? Yeah, they have to continue the drills. Um, I even think they have to continue while there's fuel in the fuel pool, which is another five years after it shuts down. Uh, once the fuel's in dry cask storage, it won't be uh, required. But um, you know, the the most dangerous part of that plant is the fuel pool, which is way up on the top. Um, and it's, it's still the most dangerous part of Fukushima Daiichi three years after the accident. So the, the net effect is by, by shutting the plant down, um, you still have all that nuclear fuel sitting in the fuel pool for at least another five years. So it's not a time to rest on our laurels and, and, uh, and say, you know, the, 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 the problem is behind us. Yeah, I, w I want to bring up uh, some of the uh, media people, the, the journalists who have written so vituperatively against the, the closing of Vermont Yankee, and one in particular is, uh, is, has written for the um, Wall Street Journal. And his name is James Conka, and he, he says that uh, the reasons gi one of the reasons given for, by energy was a combination of financial factors, including 
unfounded fears from the Fukushima disaster, even in the face of a stellar safety record and a completely different safety case. This is egregious, <laughs> is it not? And, and in the way we're, we're, we're discussing it now about the, the impact of Fukushima on all of the nuclear power plants, the safety of all the nuclear power plants around the world, and in particular, Vermont Yankee, which is, uh, Nathaniel, is, is it the same reactor as Fukushima? Yes, it is, and I think that it, and I'm sure Arnie will elaborate on this, but I think that it is going to suffer from the same issues that Fukushima Daiichi uh, suffered from, and it's liable to have the same problems that caused uh, the issue of Fukushima. Not the natural disasters necessarily, but the age is very similar, and so it's likely to have the same. If it's likely to have the same problems. And that's a question I asked Arnie the other day, actually, because I knew they were the same reactors, and so I said, "Well, Fukushima Daiichi was on the coast of the ocean, and Vermont Yankee." is on an inland river in Vermont, so we're not at a risk for a tsunami on the Connecticut River, so is it safer? Why would we be as worried about that? Yeah, we, the, the tsunami and the earthquake are not necessary to make a, a power plant like that explode like Fukushima Daiichi did. So this is the same design. Um, what happened is the earthquake ruined the off-site power. That happens all the time in Vermont Yankee, the off-site power fails. Um, and then the cooling system um, at, at the ocean was destroyed by the tsunami. But there's ways to destroy that cooling system as well. So when you have those two things, loss of offsite power and loss of the ultimate heat sink, um, you will have a Daiichi kind of an explosion. There's just no way around it. Um, the plant that's uh, in the same situation is Pilgrim in Massachusetts. Um, same design, Oyster Creek, same design. So there's um, 23 of these, Vermont Yankee will leaving will make it 22, that needed to make major modifications, but they cost so much, and the plants are so old that the management is saying, no, we're not going to do it. The NRC is complicit in this scandal because what the NRC is allowing is they don't have to make any Fukushima mods until about 2019. So they've got another six years to run without spending any money. The NRC knows that if they forced them to modify these plants to make them as safe as, as they should be, or they could be, um, that uh, if the plants were shut down. And they're not in the business of shutting power plants down. So they're giving all these plants enormous latitude on, um, on meeting the Fukushima um, backfits, the changes that are necessary. So that Wall Street Journal article is, uh, uh, is it's just absolutely wrong. You know. Uh, um, Line by line, every single line is factually wrong. Not, not just uh, interpretation, but factually wrong. Mm. Could you take us back to the, the fuel pools that you mentioned at Vermont Yankee and uh, explain, even in, in, in comparing them to Fukushima, uh, what, uh, what is going on there and, and how it, the decommissioning will impact that? Uh, yeah, the, the design at, at um, Fukushima and the 23 plants in the U.S., like Vermont Yankee, are um, called BWR Mark, uh, Mark III design uh, with a Mark I containment. And what that means is the fuel pool's at the top. Uh, we got smarter over time and we put the fuel pool down low, but back in the, back in the day these were designed, the fuel pool was at the top. Um, the, the Japanese were, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, more safety conscious than the Americans. They only had about seven years' worth of fuel in that pool, whereas Vermont Yankee's got 38 years of fuel in that pool. What does, why does it matter? What's the difference? Tell, tell our viewers. Yeah, the, the, uh, the big deal is the Vermont Yankee's got 700 times more radioactive cesium in its fuel pool than all of the atom bombs that were ever exploded in all of the atmospheric testing. So. And it's open to the air, essentially. There's a little corrugated metal top over the top of the building like you can buy a shed at Sears, but the, the pool is just covered by a metal shed. Um, so uh, the, the question is, you know, it, at Daiichi, it was a Unit 4 pool, and the fear of a, of a fuel pool fire in the Unit 4 pool 
that caused President Obama to say to Americans, get out, get out of the way for 50 miles. It wasn't the explosions in 1, 2, and 3. It was the fear of the fuel pool in Unit 4. And you'd think we'd take that lesson and, and get the fuel out of our fuel pools, but it costs money. It costs about, I don't know, $70 million. And if a plant does it while they're running, that money comes out of their pocket. But if they wait until it's decommissioned, that money comes out of the decommissioning fund. So if they can push the NRC off and delay the decision to move that fuel, uh, they save 70, 80, 100 million dollars. And they put the safety burden on us. Is that in fact what is going on right now? Yes, that's exactly what's going on right now. You know, we're picking up the risk and the people that own the reactors are picking up the profit. And when will, will Vermont Yankee officially move into decommission? Well, the plant shuts down 2014. Um, Is that when see. it begins? Yes, November 2014. Yeah. And they will immediately take the lid off the nuclear reactor, like the top off a pressure cooker, and pull the nuclear fuel out and put it in the fuel pool. Um, they do that because they, um, you want to empty the pool and, and, and go to the, the, the lowest level of safety at the plant, which is all the fuel out of the nuclear reactor in the fuel pool. Um, it will sit there for five years because the fuel is physically hot. It can't be moved. After five years, though, it can be taken out of the fuel pool and put in dry casks. And they're huge. They're, they're, they're about 12 feet across, 12 feet high, weigh, weigh 200 tons and the nuclear fuel is, is placed inside them. They're that huge for shielding, because this is still very radioactive, but it's not physically hot anymore. It can be air-cooled. So about five years from now, six years from now, Vermont Yankee will finally have its fuel pool empty and all of that material down on the ground. Daiichi had that. All, all of the dry cast storage at, at uh, Fukushima Daiichi survived the earthquake and survived the tsunami. There was only the fuel in the fuel pool that was the big risk. So, um, yeah, you know, Vermonters and people in Massachusetts and New Hampshire need to be um, uh, alert for the next six years. Where are the dry casks now? The, are the dry casks actually there now? Yeah, they'll sit on the ground. There, there's six or seven there now, but they'll need about 40. Um, and they'll sit out on a pad next to the nuclear plant. And where they'll go is another question. You know, we don't have a place to send the nuclear fuel right now. So the dry cask will likely sit for 50 years in, uh, on, a, on a field in Vernon until the United States government has its act together and we have a place to send it to. And when we testified to the state legislature, we had major concerns about the dry cask storage because they were fleet by that energy got a deal on but they're not the ideal casks for that location um, they're not shielded the plan is not to berm them they're just going to be there and uh, there's also a school very nearby there's all these these reasons why they're an inappropriate cask for that that location yeah, Maggie when you said the plan is not to berm them because what is uh, that the, it would be safer if they put an earth berm and there are certain dry casks that are designed to be built into an earth berm so that they're more stable, they're protected more from any terrorists. You know, there's really important reasons to use that technology and, and those weren't, weren't used. Um, a, a deal was cut with Entergy and Entergy had bought, you know, as a fleet for all of their plants they were buying the same casks. And that is an ideal for Vermont where, you, you know, somebody could use um, a high-powered um, missile launcher or air, um, uh, AK-47 air-powered rifle and be across the river and fire it at those casks. I mean, that's, it, it's ludicrous. The, it's called hardened on-site storage, H-O. Pass, Pass. right. Yeah. And in Europe, they, they berm them and they put a, ro a, a roof over them as well so yeah. that you can't see them from the air and you can't attack them from the side. So the European standards on storing fuel in these fields are a lot more rigid than the American standards. And again, the utilities have convinced the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that they don't have to spend that money. Um, 
so it's it all boils down to we're trading safety for profit and continuing to do so with with you say that there are several maybe forty storage containers that are needed and we have no guarantee that they'll be hard on site storage right who and but who is responsible for making these decisions is it solely energy nuclear regulatory commission and energy but again the nuclear regulatory commission the um, uh, for the five commissioners are all you know people that came out of the industry and have been appointed and are beholden to the industry I think there are only two commissioners that ever left the NRC and went back uh, and didn't go back to work for the industry and that's Peter Bradford who's from Vermont and uh, he went to work for um, New York State as as head of their regulatory agency, uh, utility regulatory agency, and uh, Victor Golinski, and those are the only two commissioners who didn't go back and make multi-million dollar paychecks, you know, from from uh, the nuclear industry. Mm. So they're bought. Yeah, money is the undercurrent in right, all right. of this. We have one case of a commissioner sending out letters while he was a commissioner saying, I'm leaving, why don't you give me a job? <laughs> and, and the um, inspector general determined that he had crossed the line, but he had already left by then and he wound up making a million and a half a year. While he was still on the board and once he already and making had decisions, job, yeah. he made decisions that favored his new employer. And you know, that's, that, that's pretty common at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Yeah. I want to go back and talk a little bit about the, the euphemism that um, the industry calls safe store because as we're talking about decommissioning and Samantha has given it a great name and, and I, I hope you'd share that with everybody. Lazy store. Safe store is lazy store. Lazy store. It leaves this legacy to our children or Sam and Samantha's grandchildren, our children's grandchildren, you know, Arnie's and mine. And, and, and it's just outrageous. I mean, that means that carcass would sit on the bank of the Connecticut River for 60 years. And I, I think Arnie can certainly more adequately talk about um, what's happened at a couple other single site plants. Vermont Yankees is a single site plant. And, and without adequate um, oversight what could happen in terms of leakage while it sits there for 60 years. Yeah, you know, the, the, the NRC made a fundamental change 15 years ago um, when they allowed these plants, like Vermont Yankee, not to be owned by utilities, but to spin off and become these things called limited liability corporations. The only asset Vermont Yankee has is Vermont Yankee. And the minute it shuts down, the asset becomes a liability. And so if they run out of money and they throw up their hands and say, you know, we're, we're bankrupt, there's no corporation that you can get to behind them um, because the NRC's allowed these limited liability corporations to own Vermont Yankee. They're a legal structure to prevent Vermonters from going up to Entergy and saying, you know, you have to pay because you got the profits, it's time for you to pay for the cleanup. The LLC structure allows money to go up to Entergy, but never, after a bankruptcy, money to return. Shame on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for allowing that 15 years ago. They were under a lot of pressure from Congress. That was under a lot of pressure from the utilities. So, um, you know, we basically have brought it on ourselves. Uh, uh, through our elected representatives, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission allowed a bunch of utilities to make a lot of money 15 years ago and spin these off. So now we're stuck with a carcass on the banks of uh, the river for 60 years. If after 60 years there's not enough money, um, the, uh, the, the company can just declare bankruptcy and walk away from it, sticking Vermonters with this, with this carcass. So that's a real possibility. Well, right now the fund's got about 580 million, but the plant's going to need something like a billion or more to clean. So and that's without any unexpected 
Yeah, yeah. That's uh, if everything goes well, it'll be a billion or a billion two to clean, um, and and so it one the costs are growing at one rate, and the fund hopefully if the stock market doesn't crash is growing faster, and eventually those two cross, and then you can afford to decommission the plant, but. Um, if there's a problem, if they find that Vermont Yankee's been leaking for years and it's gone underneath the plant, you know, suddenly it's really a lot more expensive. And it happened. There's the, they we're not talking about um, pie-in-the-sky stuff here. The, um, the Connecticut Yankee plant, just 100 miles down the Connecticut River, was being decommissioned, and they found contamination in the ground. The plant had had a leak for 40 years that no one knew about. Strontium had entered the groundwater. And the cost went up by a billion dollars in Connecticut. But Connecticut Yankee was owned by the utilities in Connecticut. So what they did was they cut a deal and they said, look, your electric bill in Connecticut is going to be $100 million a year higher for 10 years until we pay this billion dollars back. Well, in Vermont, we don't have that. You know, Vermont Yankee isn't owned by the utility. It's owned by, by <coughs> Entergy. And so if they have a problem that they can't afford, they'll just declare bankruptcy and walk away and stick us with this, with this carcass. And the, the difference there is that the, in Connecticut, the ratepayers had to pay it off because there was a vehicle to do it. In Vermont, it would go to, the, to all the taxpayers of Vermont to have to clean it up. And there's, there's no way to get it out of any other entity. And like Maggie said, there's that generational transfer, you know. People like us use that power, so therefore we should completely pay for it. Right. But 60 years from now, if they find there's a billion dollar problem, now we're talking about our grandkids paying for a mistake that our generation made. And gen you know, those kind of generational transfers of risk really aren't fair. The prospect of bankruptcy and of a 60-year price tag on this is, is really horrible to, to talk about right now. Is there any other solution to this? Is there any way that the people in Vermont can get through this without this risk and this enormous price tag? Well, stay tuned for the next legislative season. I'm sure that'll be a, a, a big topic. And by the way, there are historical precedences of bankruptcies during decommissioning. Not of power reactors, but of other contaminated sites. The owner has run out of money, thrown up their hands and walked away, and the, the municipality or the, uh, the state has been forced to pay to clean up a radioactive decommissioning. So the... the, the um, and the federal government, too, because look at what some of the Superfund sites are. Yeah. They're toxic waste dumps that all of our taxpayer, you know, taxes go, we as taxpayers pay for that. I, I, I'd like, could we segue into one other part since you of asked course, about leaks? Yes. Um, we were talking earlier about the similarity with Daiichi, and it's had, Fukushima Daiichi has had so much um, news recently about the leaking tanks. And so I wanted to let Arnie and Nat talk about that a little bit. Uh, Nathaniel has, has done uh, a graphic that, that we'll put in here to show the, the viewers. But I'd like them both to talk about that and, and what he, he learned and okay. how he made the graphic. Because it, it, if you bring it back to Vermont Yankee, if that's sitting there for 60 years, there's no way to prevent leaks from what's sitting there or to know if there are leaks spreading in the aquifer and, sp and spreading into the river. Okay, please. You know, Samantha said it about five minutes ago when she was talking about Vermont Yankees on a, on a river. Um, in, a, in a way, thank God, Fukushima Daiichi is on the Pacific Ocean because the, contam the ocean's big and so the contamination gets spread out over zillions of gallons of, of, of ocean water. But if that accident had occurred on the Great Lakes, you'd wipe out the water supply for 40 million people. If it happened on the Connecticut River, you wouldn't just, just wipe out you know, Vernon, but the entire Connecticut River and Long Island Sound and New York City because of the radiation flowing down the river into the Sound, which is a lot smaller than the Pacific Ocean. 
if it happened on the rhine or the danube you'd have the same problem so that you know i think that policy makers are missing the lesson of what's going on in fukushima that the the plant is leaking and that's a phenomenal graphic on how this these leaks are going out into the ocean but thank god it's the ocean which is huge and they that dilutes this if the policy makers looked at these inland sites mississippi river missouri river great lakes they would say oh my god we can wipe out half a continent the water supply to half a continent is at risk if this happens the lessons from fukushima are not being internalized by policy makers exactly and even now today say in the new york times the three top stories are about fukushima could could you bring us up to to speed on what is happening right now so <clears throat> what's been happening in fukushima is the water that's being used to cool the uh the fuel that's been uh, destroyed by the earthquake and the tsunami and the explosions is being stored in these big tanks and these tanks are not shielded so radiation is just radiating from them as they sit there in the middle of the countryside but they're also leaking water and that water is running into the uh the ground water into uh, to into the water source and spreading out into the pacific and because there's been so much deterioration of the land already because of again the earthquake and the tsunami that ground that fukushima was built on is no longer as stable as it once was so it continues to be soggy and that continues to let more groundwater in and that groundwater gets contaminated and that's all flowing in to the pacific ocean so nat made this really cool graphic that that shows that uh it's up on our site and um and we yeah. brought okay. a clip here we have a we clip have. okay so we'll 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 watch that the condition of the site right now is is precarious um as long as there's no earthquake um it'll be okay but that's that, that's a big if you know where you're sort of counting on um, uh, an earthquake not occurring in a country that's prone to uh, to earthquakes and by a, a, an earthquake i'm talking about a richter 7 uh, at or near the site now uh, there's there's three problems with the site right now the first is the enormous amount of water that's stored on the site in, in hundreds of tanks Tokyo Electric isn't letting us know exactly what the radioactive material is in those sites, but there's so much radiation in those tanks. We do know that the exposure to people who are outside of the plant boundary is very, very high. Now, that tells us there's this phenomenon called Bremsstrahlung, and, and the decay of radioactive material in those tanks is releasing x-rays uh, in very high quantities off-site. That means that those tanks are extraordinarily radioactive. And if there is an earthquake, none of them are seismically qualified. So we could easily have a situation where 700 tanks spring leaks, it runs across the surface of the site and into the Pacific Ocean. That's more contamination in those tanks than has already been released into the Pacific Ocean. So number one is an earthquake destroying the tanks and causing them to leak. Number two is my uh, uh, the concern I've had for years, which is the structural condition of Unit 4. Unit 4's fuel pool has the most fuel and the hottest fuel. Uh, it was recently changed out. So a loss of cooling in the Unit 4 fuel pool can still lead to a fuel pool fire and contamination of vast amounts of the country. The chance of a fuel pool fire diminishes with time because the fuel becomes cooler. It's not there yet, but it is approaching the point where if the pool were to lose water, it's likely that the fuel would not catch on fire. That assumes the fuel stays intact. If the earthquake is significant enough to distort the fuel and cause it to collapse, uh, all bets are off, and um, you can still get heating to the point of creating a fire um, if the fuel were to break and, and not be cooled. But the third thing, Akio, is what you referred to as the uh, Unit 3 problem. Unit 3 has less fuel in it than Unit 4. That's good. The bad news, though, is that Unit 3 is 
much more severely damaged than Unit 4. So if Unit 4 could ride out a Richter 7 earthquake, it's likely Unit 3 will not. So the, um, the, the risk of a structural uh, failure at Unit 3 is higher, although there's somewhat less nuclear fuel in the fuel pool, um, it still presents, in my mind now, uh, rapidly becoming the single biggest risk on the site is a structural failure of the Unit 3 building because of all the damage from the uh, massive detonation shockwave that hit the building. The, the magnitude of this problem is, is, is huge. It's as if we, the Japanese should be fighting this as if it were a war. And you don't fight a war on a budget. And those, since I created that graphic, the number of tanks filled with this incredibly radioactive water has increased exponentially and continues to increase because the fuel continues to need to be cooled. So it's a problem that's getting bigger. It's not one that's getting smaller. It's, it's a, 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 an emergency situation Absolutely. in Japan now. And people have called for it to, to be a, a treated by the federal government there. Or they don't call it the federal government there, do right. they? but by their government as an emergency, but it is not, is it true that it is not being treated as an emergency? It's not being treated properly. I believe the government has been put in control, but their ideas about how to control this leakage of radioactive water doesn't really work right. And in the film that we released, Arnie talks about good, solid ideas that will work, and they're dismissed. If we're going to freeze the ground around Fukushima, and I say we because it affects the entire world, it's not just Japan, what happens when we lose off-site power? The ground's not going to be frozen again. But if we follow what Arnie said and we put in a zeolite trench, the zeolite will absorb the radiation and that water won't be as contaminated. Could you uh, elaborate on what a zeolite trench is? I'll turn that over to Arnie. He has a little bit more information than okay. me about that. <laughs> yeah, this, this, the problems at Daiichi now were evident two years ago. I mean, there were, uh, I was one of, 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 of people, and the book Maggie and I wrote talks about the need to put a fence around the plant, a trench around the plant to um, keep the radioactive material from leaching back into the groundwater. Um, Two years ago, it was a lot cheaper because the radiation hadn't gotten out too far. Now we're at a place where the radiation is in the groundwater further out, and the Japanese are talking about building an ice wall that would go from the, the, the grade of the plant all the way down to bedrock, and would be something on the order of um, two miles long. So a two mile long ice wall, it would stick refrigerator units into the ground and freeze it for two miles. Now, freezing ground has been done um, in the past. The engineers used it to pick up the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. They put ice on one side of it, and they moved it up a little bit to keep it from toppling. But no one's ever built a, a two-mile-long ice wall. The Japanese want to spend a half a billion on it, uh, and they want to be patted on the back and uh, some sort of seal approval. A quarter of uh, the, the plant site is going to cost $100 billion to clean up and nobody's addressing that. Um, it's not going to come from Tokyo Electric. They're broke. But the Japanese government doesn't want its people to understand the true cost of the cleanup. So this is another Band-Aid. Let's put a, a, a trench around the plant and freeze it. And um, uh, when, in fact, if had they acted two years ago, uh, this problem would have been cheaper. And we wouldn't be in the situation we're in right now. When you say, had they acted two years ago, are you saying that that time is past for any other alternative uh, measure to be taken? Well, the horse is out of the barn. The, the radiation is in the soil and moving outward um, much more so than it was two years ago. So they could have gotten away with this zeolite. Zeolite's a volcanic ash. And in the United States, we're using it at a nuclear waste dump up in New York State in uh, West Valley. And it's very effective in absorbing radiation. So what I proposed two years ago was to build a trench around the plant. And the problem isn't keeping the water from getting out. It's keeping the clean water from getting in. So what I proposed was 
After you've built that trench, then outside the plant, suck the groundwater down. That water's going to be clean because the zeolite will prevent movement of radiation outward. And if you prevent the water from coming in, then suddenly your problem about contaminated water goes away because you're not getting this infusion like Matt and Nat talked about, the um, infusion of, of groundwater into the plant that then gets contaminated. Um, by the way, the ice wall won't be done for two more years, so we'll be five years into this nuclear accident leaking into the Pacific, and still there will be no remedy. And But meantime, is there any chance to, to uh, put forward the zeolite solution? You know, it boils down to money. Uh, I don't think anybody in the government in Japan wants to admit the cost because they would like to get 50 other nuclear plants up and running. And if the people of Japan knew that they were on, on the hook for $100 billion to clean the plant and $400 billion to clean the prefecture, that's like a state the size of Connecticut. Now imagine stripping six inches off of the soil for all of Connecticut. It's about a $400 billion job. So if the people of Japan recognize the true cost of the cleanup, they're likely to tell the government, we don't want to start these 50 nuclear power plants up. We'd rather go with alternative energy sources. So the, uh, the Abe government, the, 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 um, the chairman of, of Japan right now, a guy named Abe, uh, prime is minister, the right. prime minister of Japan, uh, is, um, is hesitant to tell the people the true cost of, of, of this repair because the backlash would be astronomical. It's interesting, the prime minister, because he's very pro-nuclear and he keeps talking about the necessity of starting the plants up and I think he's very beholden to the industry. His wife is very outspoken against, against starting them and talking about the women and children who've been harmed and why they need to keep all the nuclear plants shut down. So there's this inter interesting dichotomy. Yes, yes, and you, you had know. spoken before about the support that women especially in Japan right. have given to the anti-nuclear movement there, anti-Daiichi. Anti and you had a couple women on your show you had from, yes. from Japan who talked about that. Yes, yes. Yeah. The good news is that it has been women in the forefront. This is a culture of, you know, male, a male-dominated culture. And the, um, it's the women of Japan who stepped up and are demanding change. When I was there last August, um, the woman came up to me in tears and she said, I want to thank you. She said, uh, I was leaving Fukushima and I was taking my kids with me. And my husband said, no, the government says it's safe and I'm going to stay. And um, I, I asked him to watch Fairwind's videos. And he decided, no, he would leave too. So um, uh, you know, that's just one of many, many uh, cases where women have taken the lead and demanded safety, not just for themselves, but for their kids. Mm -hmm. To the women, it's not about them, they and their husbands or their parents. It's about their children. And uh, children are 20 times more radiosensitive than adults. Um, what does that mean? Well, young girls, uh, the, the chance of, uh, of cancer in a population is a number. But, but that population has old people and young people. And so if I get exposed to radiation at my age, the odds are I'll die of something else before the radiation kills me. Mm -hmm. But if a child gets exposed to radiation or an infant or somebody in, u in utero gets exposed, at that point, the cancers are much more likely to manifest themselves than they are you know, in an older person because the kid's cells are growing faster. So that's called radiosensitivity. Kids are 20 times more radiosensitive than, uh, than adults. Mm -hmm. So the, the Japanese mothers get that. And I think it's critical that um, you know, they continue to, to speak truth to power and demand protection. Um, yes. which they're not getting right now. And viewers, let's listen to this. Uh, the, uh, the government has told us through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that Vermont Yankee had 20 more years in it, mm -hmm. and yet uh, we are faced today with the fact that uh, the, the, the real reason for its closing down is put to money reasons and not to the safety reasons and to all of these these uh, issues that we've been talking about now. So viewers with me, let's wake up about the, the real issues here and uh, real life and death issues. It, it, it really is so uh, frustrating 
to be faced with a media that is completely either they they dismiss Fukushima in the context of the safety of nuclear power and say that it's it's like in another world. And over here we have the 20 year extensions and we have the building, the threatened building of new nuclear power plants. We have the nuclear waste issue, which you touched upon a little bit here, Arnie, when you said that the waste from, from Vermont Yankee is not going anywhere. It's going to sit there. Could we just go into that for a little bit now? What, what is going to happen in decommissioning with the waste? It's just going to sit there. Is that, is that the answer? Well, to there's there's different levels of waste, and it depends on what method of decommissioning they choose and whether they dismantle in a short amount of time. I think there, there are several issues. You know, the, the um, unions have spoken heavily, as, as have um, some of the residents down there, about their concern about the job market. But uh, initially, it takes many more people to be brought on site and do the decommissioning work. So, you know, it can be a boon of, um, a boon for the economy at the same time that they can be creating job retraining for, for people that will be permanently laid off and the legislature could be working on what are they going to do for that area of the state. If um, the plant sits there for the 60 years, there are all types of issues, and I think um, dismantling can happen in, in various ways. Um, there's a firm that comes in and takes out all the low-level ra radioactive waste. And I think it's important for our viewers to know what is low-level radioactive waste. Okay. That's everything except the fuel. So when people say, oh, low-level, it's just the gloves that were thrown away or the, the outerwear. It's not. It's every single thing in the plant except the fuel. The fuel is the high-level waste. Let me give you an example there. If this, if this glass were full of high-level waste, nuclear fuel, and I put it here, we would be dead in 10 minutes. That's what the industry calls high-level waste. So anything other than that, something that can you know, kill you in a day or two, is considered low-level waste. So there's nuclear fuel and essentially everything else. The nuclear fuel will stay on site for a long, long time. The, the remainder, though, what we call low level, uh, can get shipped to Texas, where there's a waste dump that Vermont and Texas are in a compact together. And Texas has agreed to take our low level waste and, and bury it in a landfill um, on, the, on the desert near Mexico in a very impoverished area. Um, and uh, um, they, would, they want to take waste for the country so that they can employ a bunch of people on this, in this impoverished area. But, uh, but in fact, um, the, what we call low level would, would still cause you know, someone to die if they were exposed to it over a period a little longer than 10 minutes. So the plan is to take Vermont Yankee apart. The question is when. Do we do it in five years or do we do it in 50 years? And right now, Entergy is in charge of the pot of money. And uh, unless we can wrestle back the pot of money and say, no, we're going to do it faster, you're going to do it faster, Entergy, um, we could be stuck with that carcass for 50 or 60 more years. No, you're talking about the decommissioning fund. And yeah. who, who paid for the decommissioning fund? Vermonters. When, when the plant was sold to Entergy, the, um, uh, there was $300 million in the fund. And Vermonters had paid about $10 million a year over 30 years, and it was invested in the market. Well, the, the Dean administration and the Douglas administration made a deal with Entergy that they'd buy the plant and they'd get the decommissioning fund and they didn't have to put a penny more into it and that it would grow with the market that, and, and, um, and there would be more than enough money come about 2020 to dismantle the plant. That was part of the political deal that was made in 2002. Well, now Entergy is saying there's not going to be enough money come 2020 or 2022. We need to wait until 2060 or maybe 2070. So the representations that Entergy made when they bought the plant, that they didn't have to put any of their profits into the fund to make it grow, are, are now proven to be wrong. 
and that um, Entergy should have been adding to that fund all along. But again, if they added to the fund in 2003 or four or five when they owned it, putting money in the fund is not the same as putting money in their stockholder's pocket. So again, we picked up the risk, the, the, the stockholders picked up the profit. Well, isn't there a good example of uh, them breaking down or dismantling a plant properly in, uh, in Maine? Yeah, M Maine Yankee. Um, we have a bad example in Connecticut Yankee because of the contamination under the plant, but we have a great example in Maine Yankee. The plant was dismantled in a little more than 10 years and is now a, a greenfield with nuclear fuel in a corner of it. So the nuclear fuel is, is a separate issue from tearing apart the rest of the plant. Um, Maine did it right, Connecticut did it wrong, and, um, uh, and Vermont isn't going to do it at all for, you know, potentially 60 years. Hence the lazy store. What, what did you say? Hence the lazy store. I'm That's sorry. the lazy storage. Yep. And what I think is so interesting is just how this all just comes down to money and how expensive a nuclear plant is, even in the decommissioning phase. I mean, when we heard that the plant was shutting down, you know, you're like, oh, it's great, it's over, we're, we're done. But there's so many more years of, of work and so much more money that has to be spent. And the interesting thing, to go back to what Maggie was saying about kind of the economics of it and how does this affect the little town of Vernon where this plant is, right. is that there's so much industry and work that goes into decommissioning and so much money that has to be spent. And that goes to people who are working as well. And it's actually possible to clean up these areas and to make them safe and I think that would be a great job opportunity. For <laughs> and and I think the, the, the example there is Maine Yankee. I mean Maine Yankee and the communities around it didn't collapse into an Appalachian kind of a poverty. You know the plant was dismantled, life goes on and uh, uh, that could happen in Vernon too. Um, you know shame on Vernon for even thinking they had a 20-year commitment to run this plant and, and planning a future that Vermont Yankee would continue. You know, the history of nuclear plants is no plant has ever run for more than 47 years. And, and Vernon was saying, well, we're gonna count on this plant running for 60 or maybe 80. Um, they were addicted to that cash flow. And, um, uh, you know, as Samantha said, there's an opportunity not to lose jobs if it were quickly dismantled you stand a chance of actually increasing jobs for something on the order of five or six or seven more years after the five years out. So and using that time and, and some state um, funding and, and, le and, and legislative encouragement to create job retraining down there or look for what they want to bring in after that. You know, because there is a trained um, uh, there are people who are well trained in that whole area and well educated and so they could switch to other exactly and, but are you saying that it we do have to wait or do we are we constricted right now to this long wait period before things can can come together well it's just what the energy has chosen to do now that gets back to the, 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 the legal decision that was made two weeks before the plant. It seems to me like... Before the, the plant shut before down. Before the plant was announced the shutdown. It seems like the appellate court has said that we have no say in anything safety related at Entergy. And the decommissioning fund is controlled by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Entergy. Um, so by their waiting for that legal decision, part of this massive chess game that was occurring. Um, I think the, the uh, momentum is on energy side here. Um, I can't see their stockholders sending profits to Vermont to decommission Vermont Yankees sooner. I just don't see that in the cards. Is the chess game over? I don't think so. I think there's still some things that the legislature can do uh, over the next uh, year. You know, I think this January to March legislative season is going to be a, uh, uh, it, the issue of decommissioning will be a real big one uh, in the state house. And, and one of those parts is the standard of what's a greenfield. You know, it says that it will be returned to a greenfield, but what that means in terms of how much radioactivity is left in the, in, in the ground 
is uh, an issue that has to be discussed because um, what is it? Twenty-five percent. The NRC says twenty-five. Twenty-five millirem. The NRC's criteria for release is twenty-five millirem higher than it was before. So the field is whatever it was back in 1970. It can be twenty-five millirem higher, and it's it's they're they're out of there. They're done. The license is terminated. But um, the word greenfield entered into the 2002 agreement. But it's not in the law. There is no concept of what is greenfield. In fact, Maine used the term greenfield to mean 10 millirem higher than the background was before. So it's sort of a, a, a term of art now, but it hasn't been memorialized in the law as 10 millirem. So the Vermont Energy's committed to a greenfield. Vermont um, it believes that that should be 10 millirem higher. But the NRC will give up the license, will allow Entergy to walk away from a field at 25 millirem. So there's another battle out there is, is what if the NRC says, okay, your license is terminated and they're not at the Vermont standard? Uh, do we have any leverage over Entergy to push them to, um, to be cleaner like they committed to in 2002? Um, I think there's going to be a lot of money in this for lawyers for a long time. Yes, mm -hmm. and as with the issue that Samantha brought up about money being at the at the root of all of this is something to watch, to follow the money on this. Well, in the few minutes that we have, I'd, I'd like each of you, if you would, to tell me what you hope for in all of this. And uh, I would invite you to come back for a, another session on this because it's an ongoing issue, of course, and uh, we never know exactly how bad it's going to be, actually. But I'd, I'd like to ask you what you, uh, what you hope for in the immediate future on this, the issue of decommissioning Vermont Yankee. Well, what I hope for is kind of unrealistic, of course. I hope for them to decommission and demolish the site within 10 years and meet the standard of Maine Yankee. But I, I don't think that that's going to happen. Entergy has not said that that's their intent. Mm, thank you. And I, I, um, I would hope that you know, political minds in, in Montpelier over the next six months will come up with some kind of a compromise with Entergy to get it done faster than 60 years. It may not be 10, but the plan only ran for 40 and we're going to have the carcass lie there for 60? Come on here, there's got to be a faster way of doing it. So I hope that, that political forces uh, are applied to energy to get the carcass removed uh, in less than 60 years. Thank you. Um, well, for me, I'm originally from Massachusetts, so I worry about the area in Massachusetts that's right downstream of, you know, right on the Connecticut River, downstream of Vermont Yankee, and I would just hope that someone out there in charge is thinking responsible thoughts <laughs> and, you know, willing to take care of the contamination that isn't just within Vermont's borders. So. Maggie? I would like to see um, the fuel pool emptied and the dry cask storage, especially the older fuel, taken down as soon as possible. I know there's a, a nationwide move. A lot of interveners are petitioning um, the NRC to have that done because all of those fuel pools are at risk of uh, explosion or fire. And, and as long as that fuel is sitting there for the next uh, year while the plant is, year plus while the plant is still running and um, then while they're waiting to move it to dry cask, if the older fuel was taken out that's been there for 35 years, it would protect everyone much more. So that's my risk, my, my wish. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you, thanks, Samantha and Arnie and my dear friend here, <laughs> Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Thank you for your, your vision and your, uh, your insight and your commitment to this crucial issue for us here in Vermont and in, in America and in the world, and I appreciate so much your, uh, your ongoing work in this it, with Fairwinds Energy Education. And viewers, let's invite them back again to give us more insight. And, and we hope that the story will unfold in a more positive way. But, but given 
that you are working on this, I believe that we can have some positive outlook. Thank you very much. You're and thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for Thanks. hosting you. this nuclear free conversation. Thank you, viewers, too. <laughs>